So this is lecture number 10. And I'm going to let General speak first because he's, he's here. Um, and our team is loyalty, patriotism, and betrayal. And if you can only take 10% of what we've been trying to do with this class into real life, you are going to be successful. So anyway, today we have a real life general. And I'm hoping you read a synopsis for the class today. Because towards the end of that synopsis, I spoke about the Rwandan genocide. And when I wrote that book in 2011, if anybody had told me that today I'll have in this classroom somebody who was a witness, he was a general on the ground, not just a witness, but an actor in that scenario, I would have said, what a perfect coincidence. So today we have Major General Henry Kwame Anye Doho, a former Deputy Joint Special Representative of the United Nations African Union Hybrid Operations in Darfur, and a member of Senior Advisory Group of the United Nations Secretary General. Among other appointments during his 41 years of active service with the Colors, he was commander of the Ghana Military Academy and the general commanding officer for the Northern Command of the Ghana Army. He served as the Deputy Force Commander and the Chief of Staff of United Nations Assistance Mission for Rwanda, 1994 to 1995 and as the Ghanaian contingent commander that, say, that saved countless lives. A decorated general of the Corps of Signals and a graduate of the United States Marine Command and Staff College, 1979 to 1980. He's the author of the book, Guns Over Kigali. So I have a copy here and it's highly recommended. Get one for your personal library. I can't wait to consume that, okay? And his autobiography, My Journey, Every Step. He regularly facilitates on conflict management studies at the Kofi Annan International Peacekeeping Training Center and the Ghana Armed Forces Command and Staff College in Accra. The retired Major General who hails from Taigbe in the Vota region, is, he's a presbyter of the Evangelical Presbyterian Church of Ghana and a patron of the Ghana Heart Foundation. He is married with grandchildren. Ladies and gentlemen, can we welcome the general? Well, the president, first of all, let me thank you for asking me to be part of uh, the discussions this morning. And I call it a discussion because I, I'm sure in the course of my presentation, you will have some ideas and views about uh, the subject that we are trying to handle. I told the president the other day that I didn't go to a grammar school, I went to a technical school. So when you start talking about literature, referring to Anthony and others, uh, there were certain things I also read. I'm not very well <laughs> vested in those areas, but we'll try and give you practical aspects of what I have uh, experienced and what I understand this topic that we are to handle this morning to be. So I'm happy to be here. So before I continued with the lecture, I try to give you some people in history that generally they are accepted to be good leaders for a variety of reasons. And you may have your own reasons. Can you identify them? Who is that one? What about this? What about this? And this? Abraham Lincoln. Good. You are very sharp students. Then let's go ahead. Good. Churchill. Good. You must have been really prepared for the class, eh? And then the greatest man of our time, by my estimation, as an African, Nelson Mandela. 
Do we know this one? Who was he? Okay. What about that? Huh? Okay. So we have come home. The great men were not only known elsewhere, but we also produced some great men. Who is that? Thomas Sakara. Where was he from? Next door, Burkina Faso. Who is that one? Bless Campore, who was the right hand man of Thomas Santkara when they staged the Aku. But I'm sure you know what the end result was. I'm sure you know when we are talking about betrayal, patriotism, and so forth. Okay. So, having seen all that, if I were to ask you to write down three qualities of uh, good qualities of a leader, you'll put down a number of points, depending upon your perception, what a good leader should be. And I'm sure you can find most of them in the characters that we saw, but not necessarily all those points. But they must have some qualities in order for us all to accept them as good leaders. So, in order to continue, I would like us to look at what a poor leadership can lead to. I use this particular picture often when I'm lecturing or I'm making presentations because I had lived with conflicts. I operated in conflict areas in and out of uniform and I know how it looks like. What a poor leadership can result into. What do you think is this? A bomb in a typical village, uh, uh, desert village. Because when I served in Darfur, this is a true picture from Darfur to the western part of Sudan. That's a typical desert village. And after that bomb, what happened? Huh? People died. And these are real pictures. They are not imaginary. Now, who must have thrown the bomb? Yeah. Uh, they call themselves liberators. You know, but it will come from a group like this. Now, after this people died, what is this that is happening here? Huh? We call them internally displaced people. This group of people, you can see them have carried a few things that they could carry. Can you imagine somebody living comfortably in his house uh, an hour ago and suddenly you find yourself in that kind of situation and they pick a few things not knowing where they are going. They put them in a camp and call that place internally displaced people's camp. They don't know when the next food will come, whether there will be a drinking water, if they should fall sick, who will take care of them? They are not aware. So when you have a poor governance, this is what you can arrive at. And if you want to avoid this though, then you want good leaders. This is how I want you to factor it into the lesson that we are looking at. If people put you in a position of trust, will you govern them properly to avoid this kind of situation? Or would you continue to do the things that your own conscience tells you are wrong and eventually arrive at this? We don't look forward to having that in this country because I lived with it, worked with them for many years, and it's not a pleasant situation at all, especially women and children turn out to be the victims. The people that the warlords claim that they want to save 
are the worst victims of this situation. All these groups. And if you watch, all the arrows are working into each other. We don't have one finishing and then the other beginning. That's the significance of this diagram. All these people must be involved if we have to ever arrive back at a sustainable peace. And we we'll do so only if local institutions are involved. I have brought this to illustrate to you if we should not be careful to have good leaders. So now we go to discuss the leadership. Responsibility and betrayal in the nation building, elaborate the key attributes and the complexities of a leadership. The importance of establishing well-managed institutions of good governance to discuss the importance of civic responsibilities and talk about civic responsibilities. When I was in school, civics was a subject. They don't teach it in schools anymore. You have all sorts of different names. Instead of teaching the real subject of civic responsibilities. So then I ask the question, what is leadership? You can read that out yourself. The autocratic ones normally don't work in large institutions. As somebody who served in the military, when I commanded a platoon of 30 men, they knew me. I knew all of them by name. I could order them, let's go, and then they will run after me. But in larger institutions, you need consensus. You need people to discuss issues. You have to respect each other's view in order to carry them along. So the two forms then are the direct and the indirect, just as I have described. When I came to see the president the first time, I, I told him that driving on the road to this place, I was going to say that I will not come back here. <laughs> but having entered his office, having looked around, having spoken to him, I knew that I was wrong in my first assessment. And I promised him that I will be here. So I'm here today to share my views with you. So the fact that the situation will be ambiguous and it will look uncertain to you does not mean that nothing could be done. You can still work if you have a vision, a clearly laid out vision. You will get there. If you want to be a leader, You've got to be able to be visionary. And you can't do it alone. So you should be surrounded by a coherent team of people who know what they are doing. People who know what they are doing. Not because they were your friends in school at one time, or you have any special relationship with them. But you know that they are capable of what doing what you're handing over to them to do. You should be able to shape culture, manage complex relationships, as you will find in any human society. You should be prepared to represent your country, your nation, your region, your district, whether it's within the international community or just at home. The copy thesis, we think it should be a conceptual thinker. He should be able to operate in an environment that may look complex to him. He should be able to communicate. Of course, the professional knowledge, if you don't know, you can't lead people. You ought to be professionally competent. Then I come to this civic education that I talked about earlier. I say teaching and learning of our, our, our values, cultural values from the home. There were certain things we were taught when we were growing. What makes our parents heroes to us in a way? If we hadn't started from there, we wouldn't be anywhere, anyway. So they taught us certain cultural values. Why do we use 
only right hand in pointing to the direction of our hometowns, why do we not use the left, as Ghanaians generally do? Why do people bow when they, 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 they greet in the mornings? They are, they are values. So that tomorrow you don't go to Britain or somewhere, come back and say that, oh, that's not what they do there. That place they just use left to point at something. It means you do not know your own values. And they are so important because these are the things which keep you in a direction so that you don't lose your way. So society will consider you either to be doing the right thing or the wrong thing. The ability and capacity to stand up for what is right, despite the consequences, is a big challenge to stand up for what is right. Everybody else seems to be saying that it's okay, it's okay. You say, no, I don't think it's okay. And my reasons are this. To the point that if, even if it means that you are going to die for your beliefs, then so be it. Because they are testing your strength. The core values of our nation, respect for elders, honesty, loyalty, reference to nature. When I was a little boy and from a village, we were taught that you should always offer seat to elderly people. And the first time I came to Accra to see a municipal bus for the first time, I saw that that was being practiced by people who knew what to do. If you sat down in a bus and an elderly person came in, you stood up to give that person a seat. Of course, you are also going to grow old one day and someone else will have to offer you that kind of uh, respect. Do we still hold on to those things? So then I went to look at the institutions of governance which these leaders are supposed to be propelling. In our country, in Ghana, it includes ministries, departments from which all various aspects of administration of a nation come. For example, if there is a total breakdown of law and order, it means the judiciary system is completely gone. So for that, the United Nations, if it's going to send a mission, the United Nations becomes the governor, the government of the country, like we did in Cambodia. If you went to a failed state, then the UN takes over as the government for the time being, until all administrative structures are re-established. Failure of leadership is a betrayal of the people who have voted you into power to represent them and you have failed to do so. Then over a period, then the state is a leadership failure. So I state here, poor governance has been the major cause of most conflicts all over the world, especially in Africa. Poor governance. These failures actually amount to betrayal of the people. The people who have entrusted you to look after them, you betray them by not doing what is expected of you. When you elect parliamentarians, you expect them to represent you in earnest. Do they? You have to answer that for yourself. Leadership many times lacks vision. And I've spoken, this word vision keeps on coming again and again. The inability to decentralize power to the lowest level so that people can feel they are part of the system. You are not a leader who wants to be dictating to the people all the time. Of course, lack of accountability, greed, corruption, these are things we say they are in the papers every day. Do we actually live up to them? Lack of coordination among ministries. When you take up responsibilities, you will get to know, you will experience this. 
For example, when we send troops to peacekeeping areas, Ministry of Defense dispatches the soldiers. But to give the troops out to the UN, Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs handles that request. After the troops are deployed, what is the coordination between defense and foreign affairs in looking after the people there? It used to be a big problem when I was the desk officer for peacekeeping operations at the Ministry of Defense. That's when we realized that Ghana Airways was operating there. So we had to establish a coordinating point where Minister of Defense, Foreign Affairs, Ghana Airways, everybody else that was involved, that we needed to work together as a team. Nation building, it depends upon leadership. People must live by example. In fact, it's not an easy thing talking about nation building, but the problems can be solved if we work together. And I'm saying that examples abound. And I compare Ghana with Malaysia. That I know that these two countries, when we were Gold Coast, we were under the same British government. We attained also independence the same year. We came in March, and I think they followed later on in August or September of the same year. Okay. But Malaysia has developed way ahead of us. In fact, when I was a chairman of Board of Directors of Ghana Telecommunications sometime in the regime of uh, President Rawlings. It was Malaysia Telecom that the government of Ghana sold the 30% of the shares of uh, uh, telecommunication to, at that time. Because they had advanced so much and established their own university producing engineers, telecom engineers. When I visited there, I saw it. I said, what? Well, how come that this world had gone so far away from us? So when I came back, that's the telecom school you have now at Tesano. I insisted that we should have our own telecom university because the engineers being produced by tech were not enough to man the telecom industry, which was busy expanding. So that when you grow to take up leadership positions, you watch these things carefully. God has given us so much that if only we were managing properly, we should be okay. Take a country like Israel. They live among oil producing countries. They alone don't produce any oil. But if you check their per capita income, is higher than any of those people around them. Need for dedicated leaders that have focus, clear focus. They are not just looking at themselves and what they can get very quickly. Because a leadership is an opportunity to serve. There are two categories. People see leadership position as a position to order others. They are the wrong types. Those who see it as an opportunity to serve, that's a better group of leadership. Today, I have the opportunity, I'm a minister. What will I be able to do? The impact I will leave after I'm out of office, how will people best remember me? Not to try to get as much as I can very quickly, that is milking the organization so that I leave it dry. You don't do that. You are serving a system. You have an opportunity to serve. God has given you that opportunity. Serve and serve well with humility. And that word humility, if you carry, it takes you to so many places. Often in Africa, I've decided to come back home. Betrayals occur in the form of 
poor governance. History shows that. In Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Gambia, Sierra Leone and Liberia in particular, the situation degenerated into a civil war where they kill each other. Again, the women and children were the greatest sufferers until other nations went in to help them. They said that they were fighting for the people, they were killing the people. When even Charles Taylor in round one was given the opportunity to govern, he messed up. So many people are beginning to ask themselves, should we continue to blame colonial rule still for uh, the difficulties we are facing after many years of independence? The answer to some extent is no. We have been given an opportunity to do things the right way, except that we choose not to do so. So we should not betray every situation in which you are, even if you are teaching, make sure that the opportunity given to you, you do not betray. I refer to Sankara and uh, what do you call them? Blaise Kampore. A typical situation where they told them, and Sankara was such a charismatic leader. I remember when we were in the field uh, in Dwarf Islands, those of you who must have read about that, and Sankara came and landed from an aircraft, he was airdropped. The Burkina Bay soldiers who were with us in the field, the rush with which they came to, to welcome him. And there was something in him that he was to have given to his country. It was shortcut by his closest friend, Kampori, who I believe lives now somewhere in Cote d'Ivoire. By the way, should your public service end in you going to live in another country? Huh? Well. So, we are trying to say that if you want to be that kind of leader, be honest, impartial, loyal to your nation and to the people. Provide them with vision and direction. You can read all that. Responsibility of the citizens, if we think, talk about the leaders, they also have the citizens, they have a responsibility. They have to obey the laws of their country and be committed. They must be prepared to serve dedicatedly. They must certainly be loyal. Hard work, and I say that again, hard work, is what propels every country into prosperity. Hard work. Things do not just come, they don't just happen. Human beings make them happen. If you have the vision, and in translating that vision, you need to work really hard. And I have always said, I have always told troops that I commanded that, if you were given a job, and you didn't know how to go about it, but you were committed, God will open your mind as to the approaches that you, you will adopt. Once you are committed, you are thinking about it day and night, you are committed, you are loyal to it, you will find a solution to the problem. But if it's given to you and you are not committed, you are not faithful, you are not loyal to it, then, and reverence to God and nature, that one, I'm sure you know yourselves. In conclusion, I'm drawing to the close now, and I'll be showing you a picture of myself somewhere, what my beliefs are about leadership. There is the need for dedicated, selfless, and visionary leaders. Teaching of valuable lessons on civic education, not given some names uh, that you cannot understand. Call it civic education and educate the people in that. Loyalty to the state and institutions or offices of employment. Respect the core values. Feel proud as a Ghanaian. 
when Nkrumah was leading then, pushing hard for African unity, it was the African personality he was pushing because he believed that Africans too, as human beings, could do anything that other human beings could do. Nobody understood him then because he was living way ahead of his generation. And things that he created, when we, the soldiers, we took over, we even canceled some of them. Progressive things that were being done at the time. I just referred to Paper Conversion Corporation. 12 row. Should we be importing? You are in an engineering institution. Be thinking about these issues as you go through your lessons here. True and sincere decentralization of authority to the local levels. Selfless service on the part of all the citizens. Loyalty and truth to be absolute. These things, you, you can't do them halfway. You are halfway loyal. Halfway, you are speaking the truth. There's nothing like half truth. If you are going to be truthful, be truthful. Be loyal. Respect the laws of the land. Sensible and qualitative distribution of the nation's wealth. Involvement of the people in the decision making. Strict adherence to accountability and transparency, which we only pay lip service to. Every day we are talking about them, but we are never transparent. We are never accountable for anything that is given to us to do. And it has to start in the small ways. You know, you don't have to wait until you become a minister before you do what is right. Then you may never do the right thing because you have never learned to do the right thing anyway. But these things were being taught in school in those days in bits and pieces. There should always be something to guide and direct a group of people that work for you. And I know that in our ministries, they have all this in, in the civil service, you know. What I told you that we took oath in military academy on graduation and the soldiers also took the same oath. These things pertain also in the ministries. You are not offered a job without getting you committed to obeying the rules. But do we really observe them or we just read them and get them? When we were in Rwanda, there were three nations that provided battalions for the operations there. Belgium, Bangladesh, Ghana. When the genocide started, Bangladesh and Belgium left. Why did Ghana stay? Because we took an oath. We were committed to the job that we had. We couldn't abandon the Rwandis in their time of need. And as I kept on telling people everywhere I spoke about Rwanda, I said, in my case, I was promoted a brigadier when I was leaving for Rwanda. So that alone was a challenge. Then you were promoted and sent to a place to the piece of job. And because the situation had degenerated, you ran away. I couldn't come home. If I had returned, I wouldn't know what answer to give to Ghana uh, on my return. That, oh, when we went, the situation went so bad. That's why I brought the soldiers back home. Would that be an answer from a general? Huh? That would have been a disgrace. That certainly would have ended also my career. Thank God he gave us the courage to stay. And that is gone into history books that Ghana at least remained and saved countless lives. So that commitment should be there. It has always been there. Whatever piece of job you are given to do, please make sure you do. Uh, and that's exactly what I think about leadership. A command, somebody in charge. You don't get away when things get difficult. You have to stay the course uh, and, and execute it properly. Having said all that, we are now at question time. Yes, Mr. President. Let me start by saying you know, thank you very much for 
taking time to hear from you. We are so happy to hear from you for your strength. Uh, I'm a little older than most of the students here, and so I knew about the Rwanda genocide. But most of the victims, some of the victims were in high school in the US at the time. So while the, uh, Rwanda was mourning, there was mourning on my campus as well. Uh, what is quite intriguing to me, and one of the reasons why I introduced this course, was that I knew about General Desiree, who was your boss at the time. And he has gone into history as having gone through depression because of everything that happened in Rwanda. And his name is everywhere on the internet. Now, if I didn't know you and knew your role in this, I don't think any of the kids in this room, and I call my student kids, not because they are young, but that's my affectionate way of saying they are my children also. How come we don't hear about you? And, and I'm sure they don't know about you until today. What can we do better in this country to really celebrate our heroes? Can you help me with that, Thank you very much, Mr. President. I, General Delay, as you rightly said, went into depression. In fact, in Rwanda, at one time, I had to ask for his wife to be flown from Canada to meet him in Nairobi. I had to get him out of the theater completely so that he could re recuperate. I could see him getting completely under excessive pressure and the tension was getting too much for him to take. And I was his second in command. I didn't want to lose him. Uh, the, the fact that even some of the Rwandese were specifically looking for him because of certain steps he had taken earlier that they were blaming him as if he had taken side with one uh, which was not proved in a way. So his wife came to meet him in, 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 in Nairobi for a few days before he could return to the theater. The difference between what his country, Canada, was doing for him and what was happening here in our country was that we didn't have the same coverage of events in Rwanda as they were doing, because Canada provided us also with the relief aircraft, the c 130s that were flying between Nairobi, and so they could bring a media crew into the place to take pictures, and Canada didn't have troops there at all. So as a matter of fact, General Delay had to ask me whether the Ghanaian troops would stay, because that was what he would base the strategy on. I said, yes. We didn't have a choice. We were not going to go away. But we didn't have our own media showing interest. We didn't have, even, I can tell you now that even when we returned home, we were not celebrated as a group of people that stood their ground when everybody was leaving. Uh, we stayed. Why did we stay? First of all, as troops of this country committed to Ghana, we were serving under Ghana and United Nations flag, and also the Africa unity. So we thought that was our commitment. But when we came back, that recognition even was wrong. And nobody tried to interview those of us who were there so that they could make even films, documentary films out of this, apart from individual media houses approaching me from time to time to tell them what happened. They did it, and, and, the, and the boys are still there. Say again. How do you handle disloyal people in your team? How do you handle disloyal people in your team? Oh, the mil military, the rules are clear. <laughs> <laughs> the rules are very clear. Um, if, if, if you, infringe one of them, the consequences are brought to you directly. But in Rwanda, what, that's why I said we worked as a team. I mean, shells were falling, people were dying, 
bodies were being dragged on the streets by dogs. Who wouldn't be afraid? We were all afraid, to tell you the truth. So in, under such circumstances, fear will begin to take its toll and rumors will begin. So uh, the commanding officer came to inform me that some soldiers have started rumoring. Uh, they, they wanted to, why is it that other countries left and we were still there? When you get to that stage, then people begin to question you, even the way you were thinking yourself. It, maybe this our commander, there is something wrong with him. He's not thinking rightly. People are dying. We are never having a ceasefire. No agreement is coming and we are still here. So I said, okay, Joe, that's his first name, General Adinkra. Fortunately, he also got to the rank of Major General before he retired. I said, you know what we shall do? Let's just apply one of the fundamental principles that we have been taught in administration. Let's organize interview. Let's listen to the complaints of all the officers. In fact, the men. The men started it so. But we later on gave the opportunity to the officers also. They should come and tell us what their problems are. From the platoon level all the way to the battalion commander, then to me as the contingent commander for the Ghanaians. So we started the interview. By the time they arrived in my office, there were only four people. From those of us who were left there, the Ghanaians, about 456. The day the interview took place in my office, two of the four had dropped out. Remaining only two. Because then, increasingly, they were beginning to find out that maybe something was not right. So when the first one came to me, he said he had some health problems before we left Ghana. But the RSM, the regimental sergeant major, if you know them, they are very active. He was behind him with his pay stick. He said, no, you are lying, you are lying. Stop saying that. Did he to go for medical exam? He said he went. So if you pass the medical exam, how come that suddenly here you are falling sick now? So he didn't have a case. So the regimental sergeant major marched him away. Then he brought the second one in, who became my friend, actually. When he came in, he said, sir, as for me, I'm just afraid. You know, he just was open. He said, I'm just afraid. And, but now I think if I go back home, I'll be a disgrace to my, my battalion. And I don't want to be a disgrace to my battalion, so I will not go home. I say, I thank you. You are an honest person. Do you know I am also afraid? <laughs> I told him, if anybody tells you that under these circumstances, he is not afraid, he is lying. But the truth is that we had a commitment. We took an oath to serve by land, air, or sea, even to the peril of our lives. So now we were facing a peril. That oath was still holding. We didn't have an alternative, but we should stay and save lives. God willing, we wouldn't all die here in, uh, in Rwanda. So I ended the interview. Since that time, the rumors stopped. We had given them a fair opportunity to express their views. We listened to them. We gave our, our part, our views also to them. Why we should be there. Then they became so courageous, you know. One sergeant went to the battalion commander later on and told him that, you know, the reason why we are working the way we are working is that we see the contingent commander every day. He's driving around in unprotected vehicle. What we call the soft skin vehicles, that ordinary vehicle, the pickups and all this. They were not armored vehicles. But we have been seeing him every day. If they should kill him, then we are all finished. So if he's doing it, then we might also as well do it. 
You, you see, that's a leadership. He said, because they were seeing me every day driving through, even though firing was going on. Who were they not to do it? If my, my death would have meant death for all of them, but I was still doing Then they must as well join. And it became a very strong bond of relationship between us, as of today. When I meet any of the soldiers that served me in Rwanda, they will say, Amokuru. That's how they say hello to each other in the morning in Kenya, Rwanda. That's become a family. <laughs> well, it's, a, it's, it's a, a choice, professional choice. Uh, I guess the nurses who work in TB wards, they know that it's an infectious disease. I'm sure they know. But they still work there. They still choose to be nurses. So it's a professional choice. As you grow, as a, if you were to read my autobiography, I said I started developing interest in the military when I was in school and Ghanaian troops went to the Congo. So there was an advert in the paper saying that if I join Signal Regiment at the time, I will be sent to overseas to be trained. That sealed my thinking. <laughs> That, I got here this morning one hour ahead of time. Very good question. That's what I call physical scars or visible scars and non-visible ones. Some of the scars are on our heart, on our conscience, that nobody sees. For example, when I went to 3rd Battalion of Infantry in Liberation Barracks, Sunyani, after we came back from Rwanda and I took over command of 2nd Infantry Brigade Group, which became the Northern Command, I decided to erect a monument in memory of 3rd <coughs> Battalion soldiers. Because that battalion was the one that went to Rwanda with me initially. Officers and men came from other units, but we base the whole operation on 3rd Battalion. So there's a monument there now called Anidoho Peace Monument at the entrance to the unit. When we went to open it, they introduced to me a young woman who happened to be the wife of the last couple, Mesa Bedu. Mesa Bedu was the first soldier I lost in Rwanda. And I saw the young wife with the, the child. I almost cried openly in front of my soldiers. And you know, generals should not do that. <laughs> but I became so emotional that I almost broke down. Why? Because my conscience was telling me that it was upon my orders 
that that woman lost the husband some of the pains that you, you go through but then you ask yourself again and again would you have acted otherwise and then the answer came back to me no i would have done the same thing because that was what i was required professionally to do if i had done otherwise and you know even when you start running away you expose yourself you can be killed in numbers you know no 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 you don't do that you should face the realities thank god he gave us the courage to do so but these are some of the psychological things you suffer in other armies they have establishments that take care of the troops when they return from the operations we haven't been able to do i believe now the armed forces have recruited some psychologists and sociologists they were not there during our time so nobody spoke to you when you came back to see what problems you were going through and uh, we hope we did not behave so badly in the eyes of people <laughs> as we walk about the streets that's that's it Thank you, thank you.